brings us uh, is the like to share my story and uh, reserve that uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities for questions. Uh, I'm not going to be able to cover everything as I was sharing with someone else who's in the room. My story to the Catholic Church is not linear. I like the way he phrased it. Nothing was linear except time. Everything else is like this. So I can't cover every base. Let me start really uh, where I should begin, which is pretty much near the grounds of this campus. About a three to four minute walk from here, I was raised in the home of my grandparents off of Hillcrest Avenue here in Gastonia. And I was raised uh, in a single parent household. My mother and father divorced when I was very young. They lived in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And uh, my father stayed there in Rocky Mount and my mother relocated to her home, Gastonia, North Carolina. To this day, I don't have a relationship with my father. I met him one time and I'm not here to share that story. I met him once. That was it when I was 17 years old. So when my mom relocated here to Gastonia, um, my grandmother and grandfather, her mother and father, took very seriously the absence of my father, in particular the absence of religious education. And they were very faithful members of First United Methodist Church Gastonia. Anybody ever seen it on Franklin Boulevard? Okay. And that was the church they, they raised me in. I was uh, confirmed at that church when I was about 12 years old, and like all kinds of youth, I was confirmed and then <whistles> gone. I never went back to church very often, except for the you know Easter's and the Christmases every once in a while. But uh, during high school, I got a job at Chili's Grilling Bar, <laughs> and uh, I was the master there. I was I was the master bus boy there for a couple of years, and then I moved up into the kitchen. And uh, really, from the time I was 16 until the time I was 25 years old, I worked at Chili's of Gastonia. Still there. It's the number one Chili's in revenue in the whole world. Little Gastonia. It says a lot about Gastonia 20 years ago. Yes. That was a place to be, Chili's. So yes, I know how to make the awesome blossoms and all that stuff. Uh, and I was there for, for a number of years. I did not go to college right after high school. I worked full-time three years, moved out of my own, had my own place with a couple of other people as roommates. Uh, and during that phase, from between high school until the time I went to college, I came across a gentleman who applied for the job of cook, along with me, Sean Smith. And uh, Sean Smith, I did not know it at the time, but he was a Pentecostal, which made it dangerous. I just didn't know that at the time. <laughs> In a good way. And he was charismatic about Jesus. He was charismatic about his faith. Now, I can remember being a youngster. There used to be where this, uh, the church building is now a field, like a soccer field. And I can remember being on the field here and thinking about God. So I, from the time I was a young child, I always had a curiosity about the things of God. And then when I was about 18 or 19 years old, Sean comes to Chili's, works in the back of the house where I am, and begins to express his own faith. He's not afraid to mention Jesus. He invites me to come to his Pentecostal church, First Assemblies of God, Gastonia. I always said no. But he was persistent. We became great friends. We ended up um, rooming together. And then he says, well, Shane, will you at least accept the invitation for me uh, to come to the Billy Graham Crusade in 1996 in September? at Erickson Stadium. Do you remember, does anybody remember when that happened? Yeah, there's a couple people here. Um, now what Sean had done through his own witness is that he rekindled my own religious curiosity. And I can remember days before the Billy Graham crusade, and I went on the Sunday evening, I remember thinking to myself, it is time for me to make a decision for Christ. Either I'm gonna go all in, or I'm just gonna forget this whole thing. And I made the decision before the altar call and I don't know if this was the same night, but they called you down to the altar. I made a decision that that night I was going to go all in. And what happened to me is that when Billy Graham issued the altar call, and I always wish I could preach like Billy Graham because all he has to say is, God loves you. And everything, everybody converts just with that word. That word is, God loves you. Uh, do you know if you die tonight if you were going to go to heaven? So I went down to the, uh, to the, uh, the stage here and just rededicated my life to Jesus Christ. And the change was immediate. I mean, it was instant. All the things that I was doing before, they died. And I can remember going down, and there was a gentleman who met me, and I was surrounded by 
uh, hundreds of other people who were doing the same thing. And I can remember he asked me, he says, you know, according to the scriptures, we should confess our sins. And he says, Shane, I want you to confess your sins. This is a Billy Graham crusade. And I remember beginning to confess my sins, and I just became overwhelmed uh, with emotion. One of the things that the Billy Graham crusade uh, does is they ask you where you go to church. And I only knew of one church. Guess what that was? First United Methodist Church, Gaston. I got a letter. I, they sent a letter to First UMC, and then I received a letter from First UMC. And I went back. And I was faithful. I was on fire for Jesus. I was a cook at Chili's still. On Saturday night, we would get off at 2 a.m. Sunday morning. I'd get up four hours later and go to the early service at First United Methodist Church. And I was faithful there. This was the only church I knew of. I did not consider the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was never even a part of my purview at that time. Never even crossed my mind. Okay. And then what I ended up doing... Um, is because of my work schedule, I ended up buying my first Bible and I started watching evangelicals on television. <laughs> this is, uh, anybody ever seen him before? D. James Kennedy? He used to come on on Sunday mornings and I would watch him. I would listen to 106.9 and this station called TBN. I don't even know if it's there today. But I remember just pouring over the scriptures. Constantly reading it. I became fascinated. I wanted to learn more and more and more about my faith. I was reading the Bible from the time I got up, and I would always end the day by reading the Bible. I would read a New Testament epistle every day. That was just my schedule. I was just voracious in what I wanted to understand. Then I came across this book, C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. And my... What that did to me is it opened up the intellectual side of the faith. That you can be rational and use reason and be a Christian. And that set me off on a new course to just read as many books as I possibly uh, could. Now, I was on fire for Jesus. Just, I wanted, I mean, I almost was one of those obnoxious zealots. You know, the kinds of people that will say, uh, you get on a bus, is this seat safe? Are you? <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to convert you because my life had changed I mean it really was an over the grace of God worked mightily in my life and what I was doing before was no more but people started after about a year there were people at work and other places who started saying to me have you ever thought about being a pastor I can see you as a preacher. Uh, have you considered ministry full time? Um, I got involved at First United Methodist Church, and I remember kind of dismissing all of this. But I did have it within myself, like, I would love to kind of do that. I, mean, that I, I have this fire. But, you know, everybody who's a new convert wants to, at least in, in Protestantism, they want to start their own church. You know, you're, you're a professional football player. You come to the Lord, time to start a church. And I was like, well, I, I don't want to do that. But I remember consulting uh, Dr. Jody Seymour, who at the time was the senior pastor of First United Methodist Church. I told him my story and um, about how I was really converted at Chili's. <laughs> really, boy, he started, and I said, I think God might be calling me to do what you do. And he says, well, um, were you involved in the church? I said, no. Or were you part of the youth group? I said, no. Were you a part of any small groups now? I said, no. He said, yeah, you're probably not called. But then he said, but I'll tell you what I'll do is that I'm going to walk with you for the next few months, and we're going to determine together whether you are called. And I remember getting very involved at First United Methodist Church uh, in as many things as I could, considering my work schedule. Well, after a period of time, um, Jody, I met with him about a year later, and we had met several times through the course of the year, where he finally did say, Shane, I do think you're called. I mean, you can agree. <laughs> I was not in college at the time. So I enrolled in Gaston Community College. Loved Gaston College. Yes. Um, yeah. I love it. Anybody go here? I think so. Oh, yeah. Great place. <laughs> and then I went from, uh, from Gaston College. I was a junior transfer to UNC Chapel Hill. And I was still reading my Bible like, like a crazy man. I just wanted to learn the scriptures. And I was reading it just as much as I possibly could have. Um, this is a few of the professors that I uh, encountered at the department. You won't know any of them. Uh, department of Religion at UNC Chapel Hill. I was a religious studies major. That's where I wanted to go. That's all I cared about doing 
was studying religion, more about Christianity. Now, this gentleman here in the middle, does anybody recognize him? Bart Ehrman, professor of New Testament theology, UNC Chapel Hill. He is an evangelical for atheism. He is making converts to atheism. And I knew about this before I went to the school. Other ones are here, Jacques Dalkleshi and uh, other professors of mine. There is no God in the Department of, U, uh, Department of Religion at UNC, for the most part. <laughs> Except for Halpern here, Dr. Halpern, he was, uh, he was a uh, practicing Jew. But I remember taking all of these classes where they were coming from a perspective of total agnosticism and skepticism. There were many of my peers and colleagues who, after taking Mark Herman's New Testament class, were beginning to fall away. But what I was doing, I didn't know it at the time, I was reading these other books by scholars just like them who believed. And so I realized that Bart Ehrman and others were looking at the glass half empty. Yeah, but there were other ways to look at this. And so I got into involved with these what, uh, apolog apologetics from an evangelical standpoint. In 2000, I graduated from UNC uh, Chapel Hill. I got my BA in religious studies. And then uh, if you're a United Methodist seeking ordination in the state of North Carolina, there's really only one school you apply to, and that's Duke. And so I uh, was accepted to Duke Divinity School, and I, that's the only place I wanted to go. And things at this point began to change. This uh, professor here is Professor Jeffrey Wainwright from Britain. He even looks British, doesn't he? <laughs> um, my very first class, my very first semester was on the Lord's Prayer. I was an evangelical Protestant up to this point. I could call myself a Methodist, but basically I was an evangelical. Professor Wainwright, for the very first time, assigned books by some of the great patristics, the great early church theologians. St. Augustine, St. Cyprian, um, the Cappadocians, um, Origin of Alexandria. And I was seeing things for the first time that I had never seen before. Yeah. Things about the mass. And this is a Protestant school. This is, they're, they're making United Methodist pastors but I was seeing all of these doctrines and the beliefs of the early church uh, for, for the very first time. But what really started to appeal to me, I took a class on iconography, and also in the books my first semester, there were these images. Guess who? Mary. The Virgin Mary. Guess how often I thought about the Virgin Mary up until that moment? Never! Maybe during Advent our, our church would do something about Mary. But I'd never really considered her before, but I began to be drawn to these images of the Blessed Virgin Mary and developed a kind of fascination about her, a pull, a draw. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Well, what I ended up doing is that this fascination after my first semester, so in the second semester of my first year, you take Theology 101. My professor was Jeffrey Wainwright. I'm still reading all these ancient church documents of the church. I decided to write my first paper on the Immaculate Conception <laughs> in a Protestant seminary Wow! as a burgeoning United Methodist pastor. And it blew me away. I remember seeing all the great arguments, you know, because I thought the Immaculate Conception, like a lot of people, referred to Jesus. I didn't realize that, no, this is, this is Mary. She was the one who was immaculate. And all the arguments and how biblical it was, full of grace, the participle meaning, you who have always been full of grace. I always thought she was just full of grace in that moment. No. The participle used is that she's always been that way. Genesis chapter 3, God becomes the first prophet and predicts and prophesies that there will be two who will, by their collaboration, redeem the world. There will be a woman and her offspring. Her redeeming offspring. I will put enmity between the woman and the serpent. Well, if we believe that the offspring is Jesus, who's the woman got to be? Mary. <clears throat> and I saw these arguments from Don Scotus. Scotus. Because as a Protestant, we want to say, well, only Jesus saves us. Only Jesus saves us. What Don Scotus says is like, yes, of course. Jesus was Mary's Savior. He just saved her in advance. How can he do this? Because God is outside of time. He did not need to wait for Good Friday, A.D., to save Mary. 
He could apply, because he's outside of time, he could apply the merits of that day way over here. Okay, I was convinced. I got an A on that paper. And I remember saying to myself, if that's true about Mary, then what else is true? And I guess what you could say is that from that moment, I began to develop a relationship with Mary at Duke Divinity School. And then the other thing that happened, Professor Jeffrey Wainwright was primary, but then one day, I, for the life of me, everybody, I cannot remember how it happened. I came across this book, the autobiography of St. Therese Lejeune called The Story of the Soul. It was not a signed reading. I just started reading it. And I came across this passage. Uh, pardon me, I'm going to read to you a little bit. I, I came across this passage in her, early in her autobiography. She said this, I understood that to become a saint, one had to suffer much. Seek out always the most perfect thing to do and forget self. I understood, too, there were many degrees of perfection. And each soul, here we go, each soul was free to respond to the advances of our Lord, to do little or much for him. In a word, to choose among the sacrifices he was asking. Then, as in the days of my childhood, I cried out, my God, I choose all. And then I read this sentence right here, this phrase. I don't want to be a saint by halves. I'm not afraid to suffer for you. I fear only one thing, to keep my own will. So take it, for I choose all that you will. And that detonated a bomb in me. I had never considered the concept of becoming a saint. And I was like, who is she? And this language is, I don't want to be mediocre. I don't want to be a half saint, if that's even possible. And so that passage set in me a desire to become what I'd never considered before, a saint. I'm moving on. So I took other classes on the theology of icons, more Virgin Mary, Christian eschatology. We were assigned the works of uh, Cardinal Ratzinger or Pope Benedict XVI. I took a class on the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, and we were reading more patristics, more Catholic theologians, people like von Balthasar. So Duke Divinity School at the time was extraordinarily Catholic Orthodox, just with a little c. Extraordinarily Catholic Orthodox. And my world was changing. Stanley Harawas, my Christian ethics professor, said in his uh, nasally voice, Methodists are basically evangelical Catholics. <laughs> and we are. <laughs> we really were. So I met my wife in seminary. We married in May 2002. I graduated from Divinity School in 2003, and I was appointed to Harmony United Methodist Church. I had to go online to find images there. I didn't have any there. This was my first assignment right out of, of seminary. Now, what was going on in me as I began my stint here in 2003 is that I was very confused. Seminary had rocked my world. I was reading all of this, the, the patristics, the Catholic theology. My, my love for the Virgin Mary was beginning to grow. And I was like someone at the time when I started like, did I just get a degree in something that was a mistake? You know how you can have that feeling? What am I supposed to do with this? Uh, I came across some books during my first year at Harmony United Methodist Church. I started reading Thomas Aquinas. And then this book by Scott Hahn called Rome Sweet Home. That book ruined my life. <laughs> Totally ruined it because I was so convinced by what Steinhardt was saying. And then I came across this book by Mike of Aquilina on the Mass of the Early Christians, which shows all the documents about how the ancient Christians worshipped in the Mass. I was becoming Catholic. And I was serving my first few months in a United Methodist Church. <laughs> but then I came across this book. The Letters of Ignatius of Antioch. And Ignatius, writing in about the year 130, said this, Let no man do anything connected with the church without the bishop. Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude of the people also be. Even as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. This is, this is 145. This is the 100s. Whatsoever the bishop shall approve of, that is also pleasing to God, so that everything is done may be secure in what? Wow. You've got to be in communion with your bishop. And then he said this. 
Take note of those who hold heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us, and see how contrary their opinions are to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins and which that Father, in his goodness, raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their dispute. Whoa! We've already got, by the way, in the 100s, affirmation of the real presence that the Eucharist is not a symbol. I always thought it was a symbol. Even in seminary, there was this kind of dance between is that real presence, but is it symbolic? And I was always under the impression that it was Protestantism, that the Catholic Church, in reaction to Protestantism, formulated the doctrine of transubstantiation. No. What I came to discover is that they needed to set themselves apart from the Protestants and reaffirm what they had always believed. That blew me away. I'm confused. I'm telling my wife all these things, and she's just saying, yeah, it's just shame being shame. You know, he just, that's just him being him. I did not know what to do. Uh, let me see this. So what ended up happening, I took a trip to Washington, D.C. with my wife. I went to this Catholic Information Center in D.C. Anybody ever been there? It's a great place. You should go there. They got a chapel there and everything. I ended up uh, buying, I, I, I went into the uh, store and I said to someone, I'm like, what do priests pray? You know, is there anything like a Catholic or a devotional book at the Psalter? And she says, yeah, the Liturgy of the Hours. So I bought these. I don't think you might have done this, Pastor. So I bought these. And then a little bit later, I attended a Mass at, my, uh, at, a, at a Catholic church nearby where I was serving. And by the way, I'd never been to Mass before. I went to my first Mass at uh, the parish in Statesville. And you know how some parishes like ours, they all have like free free medals or free rosaries. I picked up a free rosary. Uh, and by the way, my first experience with, at Mass was horrible. But I won't get into all that. <laughs> it was not Protestant. Um, usually, if, I, if you're a visitor in my congregations, they would like carry you out on their shoulder. You know, like, wow. <laughs> I visited this parish. It was like, okay, just kneel. All right. <laughs> so one of the things that happened is that this was another professor of mine, Reinhard Fluter, German, as you can tell, thoroughly Lutheran. He converted to the Catholic Church. I'm thinking, wow. So what I ended up doing is that I emailed Jeffrey Wainwright. He's a professor that introduced me to all these ancient works. And I requested a visit with him. And I'll never forget what he said. Yes, there are many like you. There are lots of people who have been under my uh, instruction who have become Catholic. I guess you're the next one. Um, he said, um, I'm going to refer you to a, a Methodist minister who is converted to the Catholic uh, Church and is now undergoing uh, instruction or the ordination process to become a priest. His name was Father John, not at the time, but his name now is Father John David Ramsey, and he serves in Virginia. So I paid, paid uh, John David at the time, John David Ramsey, a visit. And then I also visited St. Aloysius Catholic Church in Hickory, which was about a 45 minute commute from where I was serving in Harmony. Does anybody know where Harmony is? It's just north of Statesville. I go, okay. Why did I go to them? Because I did not know what to do. What am I supposed to do with this? What's my job supposed to be? I learned very early on that a Masters of Divinity the Divinity School degree, even from a great institution like Duke, means nothing in the marketplace. What was I going to do? And so through the collaboration of these two uh, men, who were so gracious, the priest at St. Aloysius and John David, we just came up against the wall. They didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. And at that point, I said, I'm sick of going back and forth. The letter of James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, and I was double-minded. And I thought to myself, I owe it to the people whom I am serving to invest for them. And so I committed in about 2004, 2005 to continue to be a United Methodist pastor. I thought I would retire a Methodist pastor. But when I look back now, I see the influence of Jeffrey Wainwright on me because he was someone who had such a robust Catholic theology, but he remained Methodist till the day he died. He said, I was born a British Methodist. I will die a British Methodist. And I do think, looking back, that that had an influence on me. 
Does, does, does that make sense? Okay. Um, a couple of things about Methodism that I thought I was able to reconcile at the time. We are not sola scriptura. Any Methodists in the room or former Methodists? Okay. We don't believe in sola scriptura. We believe in this prophecy of scripture, but John Wesley insisted that tradition must inform our study of scripture. We should be reading according to Wesley, the patristics, the ancient theologians, the great writings of the saints. He wanted the clergy to do that. That's what I was doing. He believed in frequent communion. The Methodist church teaches the real presence in the Eucharist. Now we can get down into like, well, what does real presence really mean? But that's still the language of Methodism. John Wesley insisted we should do a daily examine. We should confess our sins. So much so that uh, friends of John Wesley uh, called him a Catholic priest in disguise. Now go back to what Harawa says. Methodists are, are really evangelical Catholics. We are a very Catholic, little c, uh, tradition. So I left uh, Harmony United Methodist Church in 2008. I was then assigned to Myers Park United Methodist Church. Um, and I served under James Howe. Does anybody know where Myers Park United Methodist Church is? At the time, and I think still today, it was the largest congregation uh, in the United Methodist Church in Western North Carolina. I was not assigned the senior pastor. I was assigned to be the associate pastor there. And then in uh, 2013, I was then reappointed to Harrison United Methodist Church in Pineville in Valentine. Now, one of the things I, I do want to say is that while I was in Harmony very quickly, I prayed my first rosary. And I've shared with people before that I brought that free rosary uh, home, and it sat on my study desk for about two or three days. And then finally the day I committed, I was going to pray it, and I felt like someone getting ready to go into a cold shower. You know, you had you kind of like, and I was like hyperventilating. And I remember praying the rosary for the first time. I did a disastrous job. But after about a week, I got the hang of it, and I began seeing things in the scriptures I'd never seen before. And at first, I was like, I can't tell anybody this. My, my people are going to, like, throw me out. This gets the bishop. I'm going to get fired. What I ended up finding out is that uh, John Wesley and the early Anglicans would pray the rosary. And then I came out and go, I came out and called. <laughs> One of the things I started doing, though, while I was a uh, pastor at Harrison in Pineville, is I started going to perpetual adoration uh, at St. Gabriel Catholic Church. I would bring my, my desire for sermon ideas and before the, uh, before the Blessed Sacrament and pray. And um, I could sneak in. Nobody knew I was there. Yeah. And then I'm uh, moving through. And then in 2000. 18, I was appointed to be the senior minister at Davidson United Methodist Church. Uh, it's either the second or the third largest congregation in the United Methodist Church in the western part of the state. And, and, and Methodist language is a big deal. And I was honored to go there. What happened? During my, uh, my first seven months, the denomination was leading up to General Conference in 2019. They were redefining biblical marriage. They were going to lift the restrictions regarding ordination. In other words, you can be a practicing same-sex attracted person and be married. They started to lift the restrictions on all. They argued to lift the restrictions on marriage between members of the same sex. And that if you were in a same-sex relationship, you could be ordained as well. I'm stuck there. I'm only seven months into my time at DUMC. Guess what the majority view is at Davidson United Methodist Church? Embrace that. Yes. It is the, the more what we would call the liberal view. And so I don't know what to do here. I kept coming across this recommendation on Amazon.com. You ever seen those recommendations? I couldn't get away from it. And it was this book. <laughs> Based on your history. <laughs> You should be reading this book. Well, I decided to pick it up and read. That's what happened to Augustine as well. And you know what? When I opened that book up and began reading it, I just knew I had to do this. I was praying my rosary fairly often, even as United Methodist pastor. I would tell people that. I would say, you should be doing this. This is great because it's all about Jesus. It's not about Mary at all. We're focusing on, on the Lord himself. Um, and what I ended up doing is that after I finished reading the total consecration, I made my own personal act of consecration on Palm Sunday, April 14th, 2019. 
got up that morning and then went to the Methodist Church and preached on Palm Sunday. And my relationship to Mary began to intensify. Uh, I got a brown scapular. I never heard about that before. My rosary discipline uh, strengthened. I became a better preacher. And there was this interior change within me. And the attraction that I had to the Catholic Church that I had in 2003, 2004 came roaring back. And the more my devotion to Mary intensified, the more I was becoming separate from my colleagues. They thought I'd gone off the deep end. But I was like, come on. You should have a relationship to the Blessed Mother. She's your mother too. Oh, yeah. uh, yes, she is. And I love talking about her. So what did I end up doing is that a few weeks after that Palm Sunday, I decided I'm going to go back to Mass. Oh, there's a Catholic church nearby, St. Mark, St. Mark Catholic. There it is. I went to Mass. It was either the Sunday after, uh, it was either Divine Mercy Sunday or the Sunday thereafter. Nevertheless, what ended up happening is that after I came back from St. Mark, I began researching again these arguments about marriage. It confirmed in me my Catholic orthodoxy. I saw that there was a very rough future in store for me based on where I was. There was a lot of pressure coming from the congregation. They knew where I stood. And I was getting hammered daily. I, I, just a nasty email over and over again. Relentless criticism. And I also had this own restlessness in my own, my own uh, spirit. What am I supposed to do? So I went back to a Mass. After Mass dismissed, uh, there was Father Brian Becker who was greeting the faithful as they were coming out of the church. I went right past him, and then I said, no, I'm going to go back. And I came back to shake his hand, and I said, Father, do you meet with people during the week just to talk? And he said, sure. I said, I think I'd like to talk with you. I'm a Methodist pastor, and I'm going through some struggles. And he said, sure, come on in. Uh, let me go, yeah, let me go like this. I'll, I'll share, share this in a minute. So he said, we, I made an appointment with him. And I'll tell you about that in just a second. So what I ended up doing a little a few days later, because I found that shirt, t-shirt online. I, it's a terrible image because it's the only one I could get, but it's the Ave Maria. Can you see that? You know the little, little symbol? I was like, hey, I'm a Marian now. I'm gonna buy I bought the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't tell my wife about that. She comes home. She's uh, uh, rearranging the room, and I have the new shirt laid out on the bed there, and she had a total meltdown. <laughs> She saw the language of Democrat. She was already kind of bothered by that. And she said, Shane, you have joined a cult. I do not understand what's happening to you. You have left me for another woman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Mary. And I said, she is mother, not spouse. Didn't matter. Um, but she was very much bothered by this. And there was a little bit of a, of a rift uh, between us. At first, she just said that shame being shamed of this Mariology, but now this is a little too much. Uh, Father Becker, um, well, let me back up and tell you what happened. Let me see if I've got this. Yes. So what I ended up doing is that I met with Father Becker, and I began to share with him all that was going on in my life. Now, what I did not know he was doing at the time is that he was assessing me. He was asking me some questions about Catholic teaching and where I was. And after our conversation together, he said, not in these exact words, but he said to me, Shane, everything that you have told me, you, you are already Catholic. You are no longer Protestant. You are under an obligation, a moral obligation to become Catholic because you've already crossed the Tiber. You've already crossed the Tiber. Meaning they're, 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 they're gonna get you into Rome. You're already there. And I did not expect him to say that. The other priests did not say that. This was something I had never heard before. And of course, like a good heroic uh, Christian, I said, oh, um, I left, I, I almost feel like, you ever seen the movie The Princess Bride? You know where the man with six fingers is getting ready to confront his Indigo Matoya and then he just runs the other way? <laughs> that was me. But that was a challenge the likes of which I did not expect. 
Father Becker said, what about your family? What would happen if you left uh, your brother's church right now? I said, I don't know. I'm married. I'm my wife. I don't know what we would do. He says, well, let me meet with your wife. Well, my wife refused an invitation from Father Becker. She didn't want to talk to him. He tried to make uh, arrangements for us to meet a family at St. Mark that were also converts. She refused the invitation there. So there was confusion. There was conflict going on inside of me. There was tension between my wife and I. The promise of Mary. One of the things the Margaret says is that when you consecrate yourself to Mary, she will become the mother not just of your household, of your life, but your entire household. And I can remember making intercessions to Mary like, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, Mary. I need your help. I'm in a confused place. I'm too afraid just to leave and, and, and everything behind. I need the support of my, my wife and my kids especially. And I came across a, a few uh, weeks later a video where someone was promoting the full rosary. Now, this is for me, not for you. But does anybody know what the full rosary really is? What's the full rosary? How many decades? 15, 15 decades. Not just five. That's traditionally the full rosary. And I felt, thought to myself, okay, I will do this this one. I will pray the full rosary. I continued to meet with Father Becker. And he would always challenge me every time we got together. What if you just quit? What if you just called your church right now and just quit? What would happen? What's the worst thing that could happen? He said, I don't know my marriage. I would need an income. Um, my family is a big obstacle. And I remember praying at this time, Lord, make a way that something opened up. Help me see a bridge somewhere. Don't let me just jump. I don't want to do that. I, I want to be responsible. Nothing ever opened up. And here's where things get good. So my wife... I, I, I consecrated myself to Mary in April, July, which would be three months later. My wife takes her annual trip to Kansas. She calls me from the airport, and she says, you know what, it would be nice if I had a rosary. I hung up the phone immediately ordered one. <laughs> and I remember I asked her what made you say that. She says, because I've seen the change in you. And it's been positive. Mm -hmm. I see that your devotion to Mary has actually redounded to your good. Mm -hmm. You're a better man. You're a better husband. You're a better preacher. Everything yeah. was better. She prayed her first rosary. My wife then decided to meet with Father Becker. We started attending weekly mass. Her attraction to the Catholic Church grew. She joined RCIA. And then on Christmas Eve of that year, my wife was brought into full communion in the Catholic Church miraculous conversion. Actually, she's the most important convert in the family. She converts. My children follow. And I remember saying to my wife, I helped you get in. You're going to have to extend your hand from the ark and bring me in. But my prayers were answered in that moment. So Father Becker came to our dinner and he was still pressing me. What do I do? What are you going to do? What do you think is happening when you consecrate the elements at your, at your community? Uh, what authority do you think you're doing these things? In other words, Father Becker was doing exactly what God had called him to do. And that is to be a Catholic priest. And to speak with clarity. Now, I kept going to Mass with my family. And nobody at Davis United Methodist Church noticed. And I wasn't trying to sneak it in. you know. But I would go to the vigil Mass. But I was finally confronted in August of 2020 by my uh, SBRC, which would be the HR committee. Once they confronted me, I realized that my time had come. And I kept praying for another employment opportunity. Nothing ever came about. But then I heard this from Mother Angel. Anybody know who she is? <laughs> Faith means having one foot on the ground, one foot in the air, and a queasy feeling in the stomach. <laughs> I was like this. And I realized about that time that the Lord was not going to open up a way for me. I was going to have to put my foot down and trust that there would be something to catch it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I remember there was uh, another priest that I, that's a terrible picture, sorry about that. Uh, there, uh, there, uh, another priest that I confided in from the chair of the ordinariate of St. Peter. I'll get into all of that. But I remember saying to him, you know, I'm going to make, I'm getting ready to tell my congregation I'm going to quit. 
I don't know what I do. I've got these gifts. You know, my gifts, I don't know how they translate anywhere. And I remember he said to me, what do you mean your gifts? Those aren't your gifts. Jesus gave you those gifts. They're not yours, never were. And he says, I want you to do this. I want you to go before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. I want you to thank him for the 18 years that you had the, you had the opportunity to preach, to teach, to be paid for it. But I want you to give your gifts that don't belong to you. Surrender them back to Jesus and say, you have them. And if you want me to use them again, I will. I surrendered my gifts. I accepted that there would be no outlet. But what I came to understand is that that had to be my sacrifice. That was the cross Jesus was calling me to bear, to trust him, to just leave everything behind without anything in front of me. You have a different cross, but we all have it. When it comes to the cross... It's always a yes or no. You don't have to take up your cross. Now, we can't choose cancer. If you get diagnosed with cancer, you can't say yes or no to that. But there are crosses in our lives where the Lord invites us, yes or no. And this was my cross. Well, I'm going to do this or not. I then inform my HR committee and my district superintendent, who would be the equivalent of, um, in the Catholic diocese, is it Monroe? No, it's not Monroe. Starts with a W, maybe? Anyway, who serves in the bishop's office but is not the bishop? Winslow. Okay, so the district superintendent would be the equivalent of a Father Winslow. I let them know that I was going to be leaving Methodism. I was not coming back. Uh, that I was essentially quitting. I uh, made the announcement to the church, Davis United Methodist Church, in January 2021. Now, after 18 years, I had um, accrued enough time to take a sabbatical, so that's what I did. On March the 1st, I took a sabbatical, but I left it. I just left it. Where was I going? I had no idea. But two things ended up happening. I went to meet with Father Matthew Cowell at St. Joseph Seminary. And I actually ended up eating lunch with him and his sisters that serve at the seminary. And one of the sisters says, you're from Gastonia? I said, yes. Um, St. Michael Catholic Church, I hear, is going to have an opening coming up pretty soon. I said, okay, really? That's good. It's good to know. And then my wife saw the job posting in the Catholic Herald, and I remember I just said, well, i got nothing to lose. I'm going to apply for the job. And I said, I feel sorry for the priest who's going to get this application, because I know what my thoughts would be if I were on the other side of this. Uh, but Father Ross and I, we, we started having conversations together, and he's got a great poker face. I had no idea where he was on this, but we would call, we would have a conversation, and days would go by. Um, and then... Uh, Father told me, he said that, uh, well, you know, I can only hire Catholics. <laughs> I was not Catholic in full communion at the time. And by the grace of God, I had my first communion on the Feast of the Visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, May 31st, 2021. And uh, as soon as the Mass ended, Father Rossi offered me a position here at St. Michael and I Catholic Church because he could hire a Catholic there. <laughs> Um, so that's my story in a nutshell. What I tell people, if you are a Protestant or if there's other Protestant clergy, and I want all of you just to know this, you cannot coerce anybody into something like this. This is so hard to do for those of us on the Protestant side, but your desire for the Eucharist has to exceed your fears of the sacrifice required to receive it. I had to reach a place in my life where the risks of leaving everything behind had to become secondary to my desire to be in with the Lord in the Eucharist. Until I crossed that threshold, I would have stayed where I was. Now, my, my wife's conversion clearly helped me with that. And what I tell people today is that I feel every sacrifice, I feel every ounce of the sacrifice I've made. I feel it. But I also feel every ounce of the joy for having made it. As I said on the Matt Brad show, if Jesus is not truly present in the Eucharist, then what I did is the stupidest thing I could have ever done. But if Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist, and of course we know he is, then what I did was not stupid. It was the most rational, sane thing I could have ever done from an eternal perspective. Questions? Yes? Do you still have and would you share that Magdalene conception paper? I don't have it anymore. I really don't have it anymore. Yeah, but uh, I got a nail, and I was happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. And that really started it all for me. Sure enough, sure enough. Yeah, in the back, Frida. Um, yesterday, I don't know if you got the shot of going at you, and yesterday, um, the ministry came in, and he used to spend a lot of time, he didn't come with his parents' meal, and he's an Episcopal minister. His mom, when she got it in, he would become a Catholic, but he said, um, he said, well, I just finished this, um, a class on the four pillars Why did he get all this Catholic stuff in the process? I can't understand. I mean, I'm new to this. Why did he get all 
Because Wesleyanism, or Methodism, that's what he was insistent upon. You should be reading all the great, because tradition matters in Wesleyanism. You can't read the Bible apart from tradition. Well, that's very Catholic. And so Wesley took that very seriously. And, uh, and so you can blame John Wesley for my conversion, ultimately. I just did what he said. Of course, Wesley was a man of his time. Where he could not get past was the Pope. That was a struggle for him. But he was in, living in England in the 1700s. Okay? But uh, he was a very Catholic little C, orthodox little O in his theology. He borrowed a lot of Catholicism. To understand baptism, how we understood the sacraments and everything. Of course, I came to the, I, I told you I couldn't fill in everything. One of the things I began to realize is that if Jesus is not really in the bread, he's not really here. We can't really say he's truly here. We can in a, maybe a spiritual sense, but what's happening to the bread? And of course, the ancient fathers say it's really the flesh of Jesus Christ. Oh, I always thought that that was made up, you know, during the Reformation. And another thing that was pivotal, I remember having a moment when I was leading worship at Davidson, and I realized that I was the one who was in the way of the people of that community from being in union with the bishop. I'm perpetuating the schism by standing here. That also was, and that was the moment where I realized I just had to quit. But I had to do it responsibly. I didn't want to just walk out and say, bye. You know. But, but my wife, I needed her support as well because she knew what this meant. Well, where was this going to be? But the Lord's made away. And, uh, you know, they're, hey, Methodists are really close to Catholics. They're very close, yeah, but not close. What, question, what kind of questions or things could one bring up in, in just genuine, loving discussion to get them thinking, you know, or doing a little bit more research or... You know what I mean? To start with the Eucharist. What do you think is happening there? Do you think he's in at John 6? Do you really think he's truly present? I will say that uh, uh, what initiated my wife's conversion is when she saw, um, after one of the worship services, the servants vacuuming up the breadcrumbs. Wow, oh, that just bothered her. Um, what do you really think is happening? Let's have a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. Now, what does real presence really mean? Because Methodism teaches the real presence, but really in the details, you can back him up. You can back him up the bread because it's just bread. <laughs> I would start there, yeah. And start with Mary as well, because I try, to, I, I try to get Protestants to just accept Mary as their mother. Is there a tabernacle in the Methodist? No, there's no tabernacle. So if it's real presence, what, what do they do with these? Those are the kinds of questions yeah, yeah. you need to start at. They need to start asking themselves. Yeah. Have you read any Jacques yeah, two minutes. Yep. Jacques Maritain. Have you read any Jacques Maritain? Jacques Maritain? No, I haven't. Okay. Who would be the time to ask, uh, maybe not now, but what, why isn't a Why is it the same number one Protestantism separated itself from Catholicism over the issue of the real presence? Uh, and that's why the Catholic Church had to say, wait a minute, he's there. We're not going to bend on that. And so they formulated the doctrine of, of the name, the doctrine of transubstantiation. So Protestantism came to be during the age of rationalism, too. So it's not a coincidence that the age of reason and rationalism happened along with Protestantism. And Protestantism, uh, focusing on the rationalism, excluded the mysteries of the faith. Like, no, Jesus couldn't possibly make the bread his own flesh and his own blood. But symbolically, we can go there because rationally, that makes sense to us. Why, if a Lutheran consecrates a host, is it different than when a Catholic priest consecrates a host? But because the Catholic Church would say they have not been ordained by, they've not been in union with the bishops. Because remember, apostolic succession. Go back to Ignatius. You've got to be in union with the bishops, and it's the bishop who lays hands on the priests and future bishops. They are the ones authorized to consecrate the elements because the first apostles, they're traceable to the first apostles who had that authority and who received their authority from Jesus. So Methodism just broke broke away. I mean, Protestantism just broke, broke away. And I do believe that if Martin Luther uh, would have remained a Catholic, the Lutherans would have become an order within the Catholic Church. There would have been the Lutherans, like the Jesuits, or the Franciscans, or the Dominicans. But he divorced. Gotcha. Yeah, he divorced. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.